Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Andrew. I'll be kind of helping facilitate this book club. So basically just, you know, make sure the meetings happen. Somebody is presenting. If they can't, try to find a replacement or, you know, do it uh, myself. But um, yeah, let's, let's just, let's jump right into it. Um. Okay, so if this is your first time doing a book club with uh, DSLC, typically what we do is there'll be like a book down, or in this case, Porto site book. Um, and since we're the first group doing this particular book, um, everything here is essentially blank, and we'll be filling in it as we go. That way, in like future book clubs, they have you know, something to reference. Um, maybe if they need like a last minute presenter, they can kind of review the slides and, and use that. Um, and we'll get the links shared if you don't have it. But yeah, so this is kind of what it looks like. Um, John put this together with all the chapters, um, numbers and titles. So do, 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 yep. And let's go to this one. Okay. So this, I think this one was just like some generic that John put together. Yes, welcome. So this, this is for the REST programming language book uh, to make sure you're in the right place. So, ah, okay, here's the link right here. So dslc.io slash rust, and then you'll be able to see the, um, the site that we just looked. Um, it'll probably redirect you right now. I think John's gonna be Adjusting that, it goes to the old R for data science um, URL. And the slides and content right now is in the R for data science GitHub, but that will be uh, changing. Um, and just to make sure, um, I'm assuming that you're here and participating, that you've read the DSLC code of conduct. Uh, so the way these meetings work is we'll you know, someone volunteers to lead a chapter. So this is meant to be collaborative. If you don't want me talking the whole time. Um, and if you're hesitant, it's really, this is the way you're going to learn it anyway. So, you know, it really helps that. Um, and then we'll have a presentation where kind of review the material, go over any questions, um, maybe do some like coding or, you know, demo of a app or whatever we're making. Um, yeah, you can edit it in the GitHub repo. If we have any issues, any issues that come up with that, just put it in the Slack and we can help you work through it. Um, and then these videos will be published to YouTube. Um, so when you get these slides, there's, there's a, there's a link in the Slack. Um, this is all also a link to, um, again, this is supposed to be collaborative. Okay. So. Please, please, please volunteer. Um, and particularly for the next two weeks, we don't have a, a speaker. So at least the next week, someone to get on the ASAP would be great. Um, and if there's a particular look through, if there's a particular topic you're interested, grab it as soon as you can. Um, in terms of like timing, we're going to work roughly one chapter a week. Sometimes if it's more complex, maybe we, we split it or um, c c combine two chapters um, you know, every week except holidays. Um, you know, even if the presenter comes up, like if you find that you can't present last minute, um, hopefully you at least have your slides done and then like I or someone else can kind of take over. Um, we'll be meeting at this time. So I'm in Pacific time, US, so that's two. Um, so nine, nine o'clock GMT can work out from there, I'm sure. Uh, there is something in the chat. Is that a question? I'm Sorry. I'm... Sorry, can you say that again? Oh, do you need to type start in the chat for the recording to begin? And then um, I was just mentioning about daylight savings week off. It's off too. We can leave John a note about the start and end. 
Yeah, so when I joined, it said it was being it. recorded. So it's so um, sorry to tangent here. Hey. Uh, when we start a meeting, when we actually start, we should put start in the chat, and then when we actually end it, we put end in the chat, and that way John can cut down the uh, recording to just the relevant parts. Got it. Got it's it. It's a help Thank for you. him. That's what it is. Awesome. Made. Thank you. So I'll probably forget that at least the first couple of weeks. So please, uh, if you remember, just go ahead and do it. Um, when you're kind of making your your slides or, or, or content, it's good to have, you know, learning objectives. It's not strictly required, but like, it's it can kind of help you summarize and, and break down the chapter. What are the key points? Um, so it can kind of help you write your slides. Maybe if you want to start with that. Um, so just a tip you can have in this kind of format is like, okay, so after today, you're going to be able to blah, blah, blah. Um, and uh, they recommend kind of each section should be maybe a key point or a learning objective. Mm. I think that's it. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So that's the kind of generic intro to the, the book clubs. Um, I There's nothing here in introduction. It's not really much there. So I just put everything into the getting started. So um, go there. OK, so I'll get, I don't know if this is going to work. Can you see the speaker view? Probably, huh? I'm kind of like an old man with Zoom. Whoops. Oh, what did I do? There's, if you click the little, like, I don't remember how to split it out, but um, yeah, to the, in the hamburger menu in the bottom left yeah. and then tools, I think it might just be the keyboard S. Yeah. Ah, okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, hopefully I'll get this around by next time. Um, I did add some notes for myself, but that's will be good. Um, yeah, so kind of like we just talked about learning objectives. So just really not much to this one, um, but hopefully you should be able to answer at least at a basic level, like why Rust? Why are we even talking about it? Why are we interested in it? Um, you should be able to run a really basic Hello World program and understand what Cargo is at least at a high level and um, what it, what it, how it helps you manage projects. So according to like the Rust documentation, it's a language empowering everyone to build reliable and efficient software. Uh, so if you're like me, the kind of two things that stand out are reliable and efficient. That's what I often hear um, as like sort of the key Features or the key, you know, um, tenets of Rust is that it's it's reliable, meaning um, unlike languages like C, where you have to like manually manage memory, you kind of Rust kind of eliminates a lot of bugs related to to memory memory management, so you can be um, more confident that it's running. Um, and then of course efficiency, so you know it's 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 a compiled little language, so it's pretty it's fast. Um, but also, you know, I've heard a lot of that is real. It's it's efficient to write as well. Um, so to get set up, I'm going to assume you can go through the book and install Rust. Um, if you have any problems with these, we can talk about it uh, after this. Um, I do want to mention, though, you're going to want to choose an editor and install any sort of extensions you might need. So if you've only... Ever, oh, it's not feasible that you've only ever used R in our studio. Um, if that's the case, you know, you're, you're going to want to install a different editor. Um, I'm using VS Code with the Rust Analyzer extension. And then um, there's another extension for like debugging. It, it's in the Rust Analyzer documentation. Um, but yeah, I mean, while you could probably technically run Rust in our studio, I, I, wouldn't recommend it. It's it's not going to be fully featured. Um, so you'll see using something like VS Code. If you don't already have a preferred editor, if you have a preferred editor, then 
I'm assuming you can figure out what you need to do to get it working. All right, so this is our sort of first program, the obligatory uh, Hello World. Um, I mean, just looking at it, even if you've only ever done R and even if you're fairly new to it, like it's pretty obvious, at least the high level, what's going on. It's printing a line of code. Um, some key things to point out is, is you're always going to want this function main. That's like your entry point. Um, and that's going to be in your file main.rs. Um, I said, most of those are probably coming from R where there isn't, there's not really this concept of entry point. Um, there's another programs, but just know like your high level thing that you're trying to do, your program that you're running is goes in main. And then from there, it'll call out to whatever, whatever things you want. Um, and then this exclamation looks a little funky. Um, it means that print line is not a function, but a macro. Um, if you know what that is, great. If not, we'll, we'll get into what a macro is later. Um, but if it's, you know, regular function, it wouldn't have that exclamation at the end. Um, and then the semicolon here at the end of the line, again, if you're coming from like R or even like JavaScript, like you have semicolons and you use them, but nowadays you totally don't need to. Um, so you'll pretty much need to use that um, with Rust. So that's something to look out for. So once we have our program, we compile it with Rust C, Rust compiler, which gives the name of the file, and then you run it. Uh, it'll it'll create an executable, and then you can run that. So if you're on Windows, it'll you'll have like main.exe, um, but unlike Windows or, or Mac, it's just going to say main. So if you again, if you're coming from like R or Python or something that's like a uh, dynamic interpreted language. Uh, the way that works is the computer, or the, the language, so R's interpreter would translate R into machine code on kind of on the fly with a compile language. You have to do that translation ahead of time. Um, and one of the you know big benefits of that is that it's a lot faster because you're not trying to like parse the language at the same time, but um, I've heard the Rust compiler is really good about helping you find where your, any issues are. And generally, if it compiles, then it's going to run correctly. So that's pretty nice. I'm going to add something else there. Yeah. Um, so cargo is the other. Cargo is like tooling for Rust. Um, so you declare, so like if you have dependencies, for example, um, you have uh, in your project, you'll have a file called cargo.toml, T O M L, which is like just like a markup language, like like YAML. Um, so, you know, this would be your, your, your project name would be, you know, whatever, hello cargo version. Um, and then in dependencies, you would list under here. And then the cargo is going to know to go find those things when, when it's needed. Um, so I think typically, we wouldn't use like Rust C, for example. That's you can use that, but typically you use like Cargo. So you you would say like Cargo build, Cargo run, um, and that'll compile it as well as like run your program. Um, so again, most of us are probably coming from R. So to kind of help the tra translate between the two, um, so to start a new project, you, you just do Cargo Cargo new and your project name. This is kind of like the dot R project file for an R Studio project. Um, your cargo.toml is kind of like your description file. So list out dependencies, list information about your package. Um, and then what cargo also does is once it downloads your dependencies, um, it'll create a lock file. Um, so that's kind of like your your rm.lock. Or if you use JavaScript on um, a node, that's like your um, it like what is npm.lock or or yarn.lock or whatever. It records the exact versions of every dependency, um, so that way it'll go retrieve exactly that and, and be able to run those exact versions. Okay, so that's that's all I got. Um, 
Any questions on like anything in here? No? Okay, cool. So I guess I'm curious if like maybe everybody can kind of go and talk about like why, like, you know, talk about your background, what you're interested, why you're here, why you're interested in Rust. Um, I say, but I'm interested in Rust just. I don't know, I've been using for R for a long time and I'm um just curious about uh branching out to other languages. I think it's interesting to kind of compare uh different languages and how they can maybe do the same thing a little bit different ways, or you know, what are the, some of the other features that uh different languages might have built into them. Personally, I think Rust has a good chance of being a better RCPP. Um, when you need performance, it's, a, I think, a nicer language to write those extra bits in. Pretty much the same as Jonathan, but my, my joke answer is that I only like programming languages that start with the letter R. So I, I use R most of the time, and then I guess I have to try Rust now. And if they come up Ruby's with another not R, be the same. what? Ruby is not going to be the same. Yeah, I, I I did a little bit of Ruby uh before court like two months before Corto launched. I was making a GitHub Pages website with Ruby and losing my mind, and I'm very glad to have left that short but painful period of my life behind. Rock is also a newer version of Elm that's written in Rust. Okay. Roc. In my experience, or my interest is very similar to Andrew's, uh, coming with quite a lot of experience in R and very curious about other languages, and particularly in the kind of more engineering focus of Rust. Uh, and I really liked, Andrew, the analogies that you did. I think that struck me as something super interesting as I learned the first couple of chapters and noticing, oh, wow, you know, Rust is, is uh, kind of out of the box. You seem to have the same things that you have, uh, like, you know, in the R language, but also in the R packages, and you also you have you know a package manager, and also you have uh, a, you know an environment manager. So all these things that come in just one framework that kind of leaves you in that pit of of success. So that you know really um, you know, like I really like that. Uh, you know, looking forward to seeing the more details. Yeah, I think it's so. I I've been um, playing around with uh, Go recently as well. Um, and it's really, I don't know, it's, it's, uh, it's almost shocking to me, like how good, like the tooling around the language is. So it, it's just, I just find it a lot smoother, even not knowing Go very well, like just find it actually quite a bit smoother experience than using R in our studio. Um, so they really, I think more modern languages, they put a lot more thought into, um, like the developer experience and making it easier and. Um, so that's really cool. That's kind of one of the things I'm looking forward to with Rust as well. I'm, I'm assuming it's going to be going to be the same where um, there's a lot of kind of tools that really help you write it. So you don't have to remember like all, the, you know, you don't have to remember all the different types you're going to use in your head, but like you can let the computer figure that out for you. Yeah, I think I'm in the similar boat of being a, an intense R user, dabbler of Python, and more, I have just more interest in more in the other languages to build more other things than, other than data, other than data analysis. Uh, mainly because I have some little side projects that I want to build some, uh, like, sensor weather stations that's for myself but um it's just an excuse to to learn something new and i've been seeing that uh, a lot of people are talking about rust so I figure to give it a go yeah i would like to say i'm kind of in the same boat as well I don't have an immediate use for Rust. I might use it to speed up some code and some Python modeling I'm doing. 
but that's kind of like, you know, maybe an excuse to, to learn it more than anything else. I don't know if that'll actually happen. Uh, I have some experience with compiled languages using C++ and C in the past, but I don't use C++ so much actively. I did for a while doing some audio uh, product, do making plugins and things for BSD plugins for um, recording, but I haven't been doing that for a while. So it'd be good to get back to doing some uh, lower level programming and learning how that works. I've heard some interesting things about Rust that it, um, it, it does have a really does have really good tooling, but it also kind of needs all that tooling because of that borrow checker thing we're going to run into. I'm sure at some point I've heard so many horror stories about fighting with the borrow checker and learning not to fight with the borrow checker and learning not to work around the borrow checker. So that's be interesting when we get to that part. But yeah, that's where I'm. That's my perspective. I'm a, I'm an R user. I'm also a Python user. Mostly these days, Python, but I do use R when it is the best tool. <laughs> Um, I'm also mostly R user. Uh, I do use uh, RCBB sometimes to make some of my calculations faster. My background is in transportation engineering. So I found one tool called AV Street, which I found is written in Rust. And so since then, I was interested in learning Rust, but now I think it's a good time. Yeah, maybe if someone has ideas maybe like I was thinking it could be well maybe at the end is we can um you know like find a project and, and kind of look through it or or maybe find some like build some little project that um sorry I lost my train of thought maybe we could do some sort of project at the end right of like you know maybe there's some particular method that you guys that you have for transportation engineering and you know, we could write a little package or something like that. Um, for some of you who have been around long enough, you all know I love Advent of Code and we'll still be in the book club when Advent of Code hits. And so there's a bunch of programming puzzles you can do. Uh, you could try in Rust. Nice. I always start that. Um, and then I get through the first like couple of days and then it just drops off. Yeah, la last year... They were real hard out the gate, I think, to scare off a lot of like GPT, like uh -huh. script kiddies who were like, I'm going to go do a chat GPT and get on the leaderboard. So the first few were like ridiculously complicated. And then they sort of mellowed out after a few days. Sorry, my dog is wanting to join. Um. Okay. Um, yeah, if any, if we don't have anything else, I mean, we can finish early. I think hopefully it makes sense why there's not really much usually in the first chapter. Um, does anybody have anything? Just a question on the schedule. I saw that um, uh, Bolivar, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, are closed. Uh, I've signed up for week three. Is that correct? Because you had like something went wrong with the description thing which I fixed. So I want to make sure you intended to sign up for week three. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, I did. I did. Okay. So we but still need I'm, I'm giving myself enough time. <laughs> yeah. I so that. that makes sense. So I guess we still have so, a yeah, but I it just that I had tried going through the the icon and it didn't work. I found the repository like through GitHub, but the oh. the icon, the GitHub icon in the slides is not working. So we still have a hole for a week for next week. So I wanted to point out if somebody wanted to jump in there. Uh, and the other thing, um, I think I forgot to mention. So the schedule has like two weeks uh, into December. So so sorry. If you look at the schedule, like towards the end of the book is like spring, and that daving, daylight savings um, changes is is particularly gnarly. There's um, you know, because around the world it goes in different times, it's a pretty big gap. So I'd like to finish beforehand. So ideally, we can. We'll probably either take one of those um, December days. I think it's like the twenty third and thirtieth, or if we can find a good time to combine two chapters together into one, um, one week, because it's going to be really hard if we're sitting around for like three weeks waiting for the last chapter and everybody's going to forget what's going on. 
so yeah, if you have any, if you come across any any chapters and you're like, oh, okay, these these can probably be combined, let me know. All right, awesome. Well, thank you all for coming, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thank, thank you so much, Andrew and everyone. Thank you. See you next week. See ya.